now let's calculate the energy gain in the time varying field so as you already know let's say um, let's say we have a dc field okay so the energy gain in the dc field so here this there is a dc field here okay so there is an electric field here dc electric field here and uh, so you can calculate by simply integrating q into integral e dot dz over the length of the gap so this is equal to q into e into g which is equal to q v0 this you have already studied you already know that the energy gain in a dc accelerator is q into the voltage seen by the charged particle now the energy gain in a time varying field so here the situation is little complicated because the electric field is no longer a constant value it is now varying with time okay so the rf field is changing while the particle is in the gap so for simplicity for in the first case let us assume that so we we calculate the energy gain of uh, in the time varying field on the axis so on the axis means at r is equal to 0 we also assume that there is no variation of ez with z okay so it's constant with z so it's varying with time it's varying with time but with z there is no variation okay in real life there will be variation because there is a there is a gap here so the fields there will be fringing fields so it the field will not be straight lines it will be something like this okay but for the time being let's calculate when uh, the electric field is constant with z there is no variation with z so again the energy gain is given by q integral e dot dz integrated over the uh, length of the gap now here now ez is equal to e0 cos omega t plus 5 so there is time variation so the form of ez is like this so energy gain uh, so energy gain again let's come back to this so this is the electric field the energy gain in the gap is simply this now where at t is equal to 0 at t is equal to 0 the field at the center of the gap is this value okay so the particle is at the center of the gap z is equal to 0 and the phase of the field relative to the crest okay so this this phase is equal to phi at the center at t is equal to 0 so this is the part of the electric field that the particle is seen at time t is equal to 0 so now assuming that the velocity change in the gap is small so we can write t as z by v so omega t can be written as omega is 2 pi f and t can be written as z by v so this is 2 pi f z by v can be written as beta c so omega t 2 pi z by beta lambda now in this expression since this is integration over z we can replace omega t with 2 pi z by beta lambda so if we do that this is what we get and now we can expand this uh, cos function cos a plus b is equal to cos a cos b plus sin a sin b so we simply expand this and then we notice that the second integral goes to zero since it is an odd function of z so we are left with just this first integral so if you integrate this so here you can see that cos phi is independent of z so it can come out of the integral so you have to integrate just cos 2 pi z by beta lambda so integrating this and applying the limits we get q e0 cos phi 2 times sin pi g by beta lambda upon 2 pi by beta lambda so this two can be cancelled now we can multiply and divide by g okay uh, so we get here q e0 g okay cos phi and this factor here so this can be now written as the energy gain in a time varying field can be written as q e0 g t cos phi where t is equal to this factor this factor is denoted by t so it is sin pi g by beta lambda upon pi g by beta lambda this t is called the transit time factor so now the energy gain in the gap is q into e0 g now this q into e0 g is simply the energy gain in the dc field this is what 
we had got. Now, in addition to this, we have two more terms, okay, the transit time factor and the cost phi. So, T is the transit time factor which is given by sin pi g by beta lambda upon pi g by beta lambda and cos phi. Cos phi is coming into picture because it depends upon the phase of the field that what is the value of the electric field that is going to be seen by the charge particle. So, if it is phi, it will see this. If it was 0, it will see a maximum field. So, or if it was uh, pi by 2, it will see a 0 field. So, it depends upon what is the phase of the uh, electric field that is seen by the particle. So, uh, this, that is why this phi factor is coming into picture. <clears throat> so, now we see that regardless of this phi, so okay, we can take phi as equal to 0 so that this term is equal to 1. Regardless of the phase phi, okay, the energy gain in a time varying field, okay, is always less than the energy gain in a DC field, okay. So, because this, this factor T is always less than 1, sin x upon x, it is always less than 1. So, we see that regardless of whatever phase we choose, okay, the total energy gain in the gap is always going to be less than the energy gain in a DC field. And this is by a factor t. So, if you draw this uh, uh, transit time factor, so it is of the form sin x by x. So, you draw this transit time factor versus g by beta lambda. So, we see that it is maximum, it has a value 1 for g equal to 0. Now, g equal to 0 is not possible because that means there is no gap, so no acceleration. Okay, and as the gap length increases, the transit time the transit time factor decreases and hence the energy gain decreases. So, one of the important uh, criteria of linear design is to maximize the value of transit time factor. So, you have to have a proper compromise. Now, let us say you make the gap too small, then there could be breakdown. The electric field locally could be very high and there could be a breakdown. So, you have to optimize what value of transit time factor you have to choose. So, T is a measure of the reduction in the energy gain caused by the time, sinusoidal time variation of the field in the gap. So, T is always less than 1 for a finite width of the gap. The factor comes because the particle takes a finite time to travel through that gap in which the field is changing. Okay? So, this, this factor is coming because see in a DC field, the electric field is constant. So, in a DC field, the electric field is constant. Whereas in the RF field, it is changing like this. It is There is a finite time to transit the gap and during this time, the field is changing with time. So, because of this, the uh, transit time factor is coming into picture. And as I said, important criteria in Linac design is to maximize the value of T. Okay, now let us uh, calculate the transit time factor if E0 is not constant along the uh, axis. Okay, so now Ez is a function of Z. So, as I said, there will be, so uh, this is one drift tube, this is the hole in between, this is another drift tube, okay, and this is the hole in between. So, electric field lines, if you calculate, if you see here, they are, uh, because of the fringing fields, they are not straight. So, Ez has a variation with both R and Z. So, a more realistic accelerating field depends on both R and Z. Okay, so here Ez can now be written as E, the amplitude is a function of both R and Z. So, again calculating the energy gain in the same way. So, energy gain is uh, Q integral E dot dz minus G by 2 to G by 2. And uh, let us say for now you are calculating at R is equal to 0. Okay, so E there is just a variation in uh, Ez with Z. So, you are calculating, so here now this becomes E 0 Z because R is equal to 0. So, again like before, we expand this uh, cosine function cos A plus cos B is equal to cos A cos B plus sin A sin B. And then we can choose the origin at the electric center of the gap. Okay? The electric center of the gap is defined as integral E 0 Z sin omega T z dz is equal to 0. So, if we choose the origin at the electrical center of the gap, so this is, 
So here uh, this term goes to 0 and we are left with just the first term. So the energy gain is now just this part. Now remember that the voltage in the gap can be calculated by simply integrating the electric field in the gap. So here now we divide and multiply by this voltage. So we have multiplied here and divided here by the voltage. So we get this expression and cos phi is independent of z so we can take it outside okay so just compare this so we are we have q okay this is the voltage v0 and then there is this cos phi so if you compare it to the formula of energy gain in time varying fields you see that this factor has to be transit time factor so this is the general form of the transit time factor when your electric field is not uh, constant along z it is varying with z so it's simply this integral follow uh, divided by the voltage. Okay, again assuming that the velocity change in the gap is small, you can write omega t as 2 pi z by beta lambda and you can write 2 pi by beta lambda as kz. So you can substitute here omega t as equal to kz. So the general formula for transit time factor is now at r is equal to 0 and ez varying with z okay so it is now 1 by v naught an integral minus g by 2 to g by 2 e 0 z cos k z dz so where voltage is given by this expression and k is equal to 2 pi by beta lambda now if you if you have a radial dependence also so that means now here uh, this is this was calculated at r is equal to 0 we calculate at some general r so electric field can vary with r also and in fact it will as you can see here there is variation with r so then the transit time factor for a general r and k or general r and z can simply be replaced by this expression so e is now a function of r and z cos kz dz so this is the general formula for transit time factor Okay, now coming back to this slide from lecture 1. So, the difference between proton and electron. So, if you remember uh, what we learnt in the first lecture, we saw that the electron becomes relativistic at very low energy. So, it approaches the velocity of light at very low energies and from then on there is not much change in the velocity. V is constant. What is increasing is the mass of the uh, electron. The proton on the other hand, uh, its velocity is increasing uh, till about 1 GV and then it becomes constant. Okay, And uh, if you have heavier ions then their graph will be like this, will be even different. So this as we discussed yesterday, this has important implications on the design of both proton and electron axon. Uh, so now from whatever we have learned, let us see what is the difference between electron and ion accelerators. So, the velocity of the electrons is almost constant, okay. So, V is equal to, almost equal to C, okay. Even at low energies, the velocity has become almost constant. So, beta is almost equal to 1. So, the cell length, okay, which is, uh, you have seen that for uh, pi mode structure, it is beta lambda by 2 and for the zero mode structure it is beta lambda. Now cell length depends upon what beta. So for the electron accelerators the cell length is constant because beta is constant. For proton accelerators on the other hand, so for proton you can see that beta is increasing. So as beta is increasing the cell length will also increase. So velocity of the ions or protons increases with the kinetic energy, hence the cell length will also increase to maintain the synchronism. Now since the electrons move with almost constant velocity, phase stability is not so important for electrons. Now why is this problem of phase stability coming? Because the early particle and late particles are moving with velocities different from that of the synchronous particle. Okay, For the, uh, for the electrons, all particles will move with the same velocity. So this uh, problem of early particle coming even earlier or the late particle coming even later is not there with electrons. So in fact for electrons you can use 
the synchronous phase as zero because here you will get maximum acceleration and since there is no problem of phase stability so you can uh, operate here and get maximum energy gain now since beta for electrons is very high so beta is close to one so beta for electrons is very high as compared to ions electron accelerators are operated at high frequencies now see what is the cell length the cell length is equal to beta lambda now beta is already very high in the case of electrons as compared to proton or ion accelerators okay so if beta is high in order to keep the cell length at a reasonable value lambda should be small or in other words you can you should operate at higher frequencies so uh, electron accelerators are operated at higher frequencies often in the gigahertz range whereas ion accelerators are operated at lower frequencies depending on what is the value of beta so lower the beta lower is the value of the frequency that is used for acceleration so coming back to this slide again so uh, the first accelerator which was uh, which was conceived by icing and widrow as i said it consisted of drift tubes to which rf voltage was directly applied the rf voltage was directly applied and this was kept this whole system was kept inside an evacuated glass cylinder now all accelerators they operate in vacuum because otherwise the charged particles will collide with the uh, particles the air or atmosphere and they will lose energy and get scattered so they are uh, all accelerators are operated in under vacuum condition so there is an evacuated glass cylinder and this is how acceleration took place so this worked very well at lower energies but when people tried to increase the energy so what happened now cell length is equal to beta lambda so as beta increased okay in order to keep the cell length reasonable lambda had to be decreased or in other words frequency had to be increased now the problem with such a system where the rf voltage is directly applied to these uh, drift tubes or hollow cylinders is that at higher frequencies when the wavelengths become comparable to the size of these drift tubes this system starts radiating okay so instead of storing energy here in the, in the gaps in the form of electric field so this starts radiating the energy like an antenna so the power radiate uh, the radiated power is given by this formula half c vrf square where c is the capacitance of this region and vrf is the applied rf voltage so such a system failed to work at higher energies because you had to go to higher frequencies and at higher frequencies this started uh, radiating like an antenna <clears throat> so what is the solution in 1946 alvarez overcome overcame this problem he put the drift tubes inside a high q cavity so remember in the first case uh, widrow had icing and widrow had kept it inside a hollow uh, glass inside a evacuated glass tube so what did alvarez do he kept it inside a evacuated metal cylinder so a metal cylinder becomes a cavity okay so this is a high q cavity high q means something that stores more energy so q is the quality factor something that stores more energy than it dissipates and then utilizing the time varying electric fields associated with the standing electromagnetic wave set up in the cavity so what did he do he took a high q cavity and now instead of applying voltage see there is no voltage applied directly to the drift tubes uh what he did was put in electromagnetic waves inside this cavity and then using the electric fields associated with the electromagnetic fields so you know that electromagnetic fields um, electromagnetic waves have electric fields and magnetic fields so the electric field is also varying in time so he utilized the electric fields associated with these electromagnetic waves and then used it for acceleration okay so this type of structure was a zero mode structure the cell length is equal to beta lambda and uh, so let's now try to understand how he used the electric fields of the electromagnetic waves for acceleration so in order to understand this let's uh, come back to the electromagnetic waves in free space 
so we have maxwell's equation this is the general form of uh, maxwell's equation so divergence of d is rho divergence of b is zero curl of e is minus del b by del t curl of h is j plus del d by del t where rho is the electric charge density and j is the current density and uh, if you do it in uh, if you write the maxwell's equation in free space so there are no charges or currents so the charge and current you can put rho is equal to 0 and you can put the current as equal to 0 so this is what you get okay and here 1 by c square is equal to mu 0 epsilon 0 now we want to find a solution satisfying the maxwell's equation in free space so taking the curl of the uh, equation curl of e so curl of e is minus uh, del b by del t we take the curl and use the vector identity here so this is what we uh, get on the left hand side and the right hand side now since we know that in free space divergence of e is equal to 0 and curl of b is equal to 1 by c square del e by del t so we just substitute here this goes to 0 and uh, curl of b is equal to 1 by c square del e by del t so we get a equation in the form of e this is the wave equation this and it has plane wave solutions of the form like this okay so this is like us uh, this is like a traveling wave solution it is plane wave traveling wave solution <clears throat> so here e0 is the amplitude k is the wave number and omega is the angular frequency so e0 is amplitude and uh, the phase velocity is c which is given by omega by k which is equal to 1 upon under root mu 0 epsilon 0. So uh, this relation between any relation between omega and k this is known as the dispersion relation. Now similarly again we take the curl of the equation curl of b uh, so here and, and we do the same uh, simplification so we get a wave equation for b as well okay. So this is a again a plane wave equation uh, and it has a solution like this. And similarly here b0 is the amplitude k is the wave number or the uh, propagation constant so <clears throat> again we get the same dispersion relation here also now since curl of e is equal to minus del b by del t and we've already found out expressions for e and b we simply substitute here in this uh, expression so we get here k into e0 is equal to omega b0 Okay, so if this implies, now you can see from this uh, expression, this implies that k, e0 and b0, okay, they are mutually perpendicular to each other. They are all mutually perpendicular to each other. Also, we have curl of b is equal to 1 by c square del e by del t. So again, substituting these two equations here, we get another expression, k cross b0 is equal to minus omega by c square e0. So this again suggests that the propagation constant, the magnetic field and the electric field, they are mutually perpendicular to each other. Also from this we can get that the electric and magnetic field amplitudes, they are related as E0 by B0 is equal to C. So that means E0 is more than B0 by a factor of C. So thus uh, from this we get electromagnetic waves in free space. So electromagnetic waves in free space are TEM type of waves. Okay. So TEM means transverse electric and magnetic. So we see that the electric field is perpendicular to the magnetic field. So they are mutually perpendicular and they are perpendicular to the direction of propagation as well. So the wave is propagating in this direction and we have an electric field which is sinusoidal and perpendicular to k we also have a magnetic field which is sinusoidal and perpendicular to k and electric field and magnetic field are also mutually perpendicular to each other so electromagnetic waves in free space they are plane waves uh, they are tem waves both electric and magnetic fields are mutually perpendicular to each other and to the direction of propagation and uh, magnitude of electric field is more than that of the magnetic field by a factor of c okay now it is important to note here that even though electro uh, so we have a we have an electric field uh, in, in an electromagnetic wave we have an uh, electric field okay which is which has a sinusoidal variation okay and you know how to accelerate charged particles using sinusoidal variation 
So even though uh, it has a sinusoidal time variation, we cannot use the electromagnetic waves in free space for acceleration. As now if you want to use this for acceleration, your beam must co-propagate with this, okay, this wave. So the wave is moving in this direction and the beam also has to move in this direction such that it always sees the electric field. And now notice that if the beam also moves in this direction, that means along the direction of K, then what happens is that the electric field is always perpendicular to the uh, direction of velocity of the charged particles, okay. So, uh, E dot V will be equal to 0 and there will be no acceleration. So, for change in kinetic energy, there should be a component of electric field in the direction of propagation of the charged particle. So, electromagnetic waves in free space cannot be used for acceleration as the electric field will be perpendicular to the direction of beam velocity at all times. Okay, so finally summarizing. So with time varying fields, you can use the same small voltage, it can be used repeatedly to accelerate to high energies by successively accelerating charged particles over many gaps. Okay, so here unlike DC, uh, DC accelerator, you, you need not generate a very high field. You, you can generate a small voltage and or a small electric field and this can be used uh, several times over uh, several gaps and uh, the total energy gain will, uh, will depend upon n into delta w. So how many gaps you have and the energy gain in each gap. So this energy gain in each gap need not be very high. In a DC accelerator, this itself we try to maximize by generating a high voltage. Here, this number can be small. This, by increasing the value of n, we can accelerate to very high energies. Okay, so the necessary condition for acceleration using time varying fields is isochronism. That is, the particle arrives at each gap at the right time, okay, or in the right uh, phase of the electric field. It has to see the right phase of the electric field every time. To get accelerated okay and of course there should be a component of electric field in the direction of velocity of the beam and uh, without isochronism also we can get acceleration but we cannot get sustained acceleration so in order to get sustained acceleration isochronism is very important so the cell length should be adjusted such that the particle arrives from one gap to the next gap in time t by 2 or t as it may be if it's a pi mode structure or a zero mode structure. So for sustained acceleration over large lengths many uh, of uh, over many tens of accelerating gaps isochronism is very important. So this is known as the principle of successive acceleration and uh, we do not use the entire positive cycle for acceleration okay because then there will be a huge spread in the kinetic energy. So we use only a small uh, uh, portion of the RF cycle for acceleration. So, even in the positive cycle, we do not use the entire positive cycle We uh, for acceleration with stability, with phase stability. We use the portion where the synchronous phase lies between minus pi by 2 and 0. If you use the portion from 0 to pi by 2, there is no phase stability. There is acceleration, but there is no phase stability and uh, you will not be able to get sustained acceleration. Then we also calculated the energy gain in the uh, time varying field and we saw that the energy gain in the time varying field is less than the energy gain in a DC field by a factor of t. This is because the, uh, the, the t is known as the transit time factor and this is because the, uh, the beam takes a finite time to transit through the gap and during that time the field in the gap is not constant, it is changing with time. So because of which this uh, transit time factor comes into picture. Okay, so in the next lecture, we will see more about electromagnetic waves in a medium bounded by conducting boundaries and we will see that how they can be used for 